those off. We'd appreciate that. You're more than welcome to turn them on at the end where you are going to be asking Chris some questions. Uh, Chris Bogman is our speaker today and he's director and principal consultant at Soda Geosciences. Chris is UK based um, and he has a BC degree in geology from Leicester University and an MSc in mineral resources from Cardiff University. Chris spent his early career working and living in Southern Africa, initially with De Beers in Botswana and then in South Africa with JCR. Following the completion of his MSc in 1999, Chris worked for mining industry consulting groups in the UK and several mining and mineral exploration companies in a variety companies in a variety of countries, including Argentina, Armenia, Colombia, Finland, Kazakhstan, Mauritania, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Turkey, and Uzbekistan. Chris has extensive experience in running mineral exploration programs um, and within the Arabian Nubian Shield in particular. He spent nine years working in Sudan and Saudi Arabia resulting in a unique and extensive knowledge of the geology and mineral deposits of the region. So with that, I'll hand you over to Chris. Great, uh, thanks. Thanks, Nalene, for the introduction. Uh, great to be actually contributing something to the GSSA again, having spent so long working out, out there, uh, actually many years ago now. Um, great to see Frank Gregory's name on the list there as well. I know Frank very well. Um, Today we're talking about the Arabian Nubian Shield. Um, it's a part of the it's part of the world that hasn't really got the attention it deserves from a mineral deposits point of view, but it's a, a part of the world that's got some fascinating geology and some absolutely phenomenal mineral deposits and potential. Um, I spent uh, seven years working in Sudan. Um, and I've also spent a couple of years in Saudi Arabia, so I know the mineral deposits of that part of the world very well, and I'm going to share some of those uh, insights and some of the geology with you today. Um, I'm going to start with a sort of brief introduction of the Arabian Nubian Shield as a geological terrain, then move on to some of the, um, uh, the mineral deposits. Um, it, won't, it won't be all of them, and I'll, I'm going to focus on the the metalliferous deposits. Um, I'll then focus on the um, African countries because that's really the sort of uh, slant of this talk. So uh, it'll be a focus on Sudan, Egypt, Eritrea and Ethiopia, which are the, the main countries. Um, they've all got mining industries and they've all got mining industries that could be a lot bigger than they are at the moment. And then I'll um, conclude with some sort of final comments. Um, Arabian Nubian Shield is a Neoproterozoic orogenic cycle. It's a complete cycle, um, ran between 870 million to about 520. Uh, the breakup of Rodina, Rodinina and uh, the assembly of Gondwana. Um, the early stages were oce oceanic crust formation, island arcs, um, seafloor spreading. Then that was followed by the closure of the ocean and then fire. And then after that, quite a lot of crustal shortening and deformation um, between the two and yeah, between the two sides of uh, Gondwana, west, west and east. Uh, there we go. Um, where are we sitting? Um, that's a the base maps, the one of the UNESCO geological maps of the world. Um, which I've modified just for the, the use here. The uh, solid black line is the um, Neoproterozoic outcrops. Um, the red sea down the middle, which is splitting the, um, the shield apart. The purple with the dashed line are the younger uh, basalts and harats in, in Saudi, um, which result from the you know, result of the Red Sea and the Afar Rift. Um, the ANS itself uh, just gets into Jordan and Israel in the north, sitting in Egypt, Sudan, down into Ethiopia. Uh, Saudi Arabia has a large portion over here, and that's probably a talk in its own right, which is uh, which is not, I'm not going to cover today. Down into Yemen and just just catches in into some uh, the north of Somalia, Somalia as well. Um, the, um, it's overlain by Mesozoic sediments, uh, starting from Cambrian in Saudi, 
and in on the African side in Egypt and Sudan, it's it's a little bit later. It's uh, sort of Jurassic Cretaceous age. And then from 30 million years on, the Red Sea Rift and the, and the Afar hotspots um, developed and the whole area began to, uh, began to separate. The, in, an, in an African uh, context, um, this is the uh, map that came out of the episodes volume a few years ago. Um, the Arabian Nubian shield sitting in here. Um, the rest of the African cradons I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, East, East Sahara mega craton was the um, West Gondwana craton that um, East Gondwana, which would sit in here, collided with. The, um, Nubi the, the ANS is part of the uh, orogenic belts that run all the way down into Mozambique. Um, I think what's one thing that's important and often surprises people when they when they ANS gets talked about is the actual size of it. Uh, the three maps in the bottom show the ANS, um, including obviously including the Saudi side here, with the cratons in Western Australia and the cratons in Canada. Um, so the yeah you know, they they're all similar sizes. Um, what the African map shows is obviously the size of the, well, in this case, the Nubian shield, because it's the African side shown here, uh, with the West African cratons that I think a lot of people are probably familiar with in the, in the, gold, the gold industry. And then they're similar sizes. Um, Canada, Australia, and uh, West Africa have substantial gold mining industries. Uh, the Nubian shield at the moment um, is still developing. Um, there is the, the, la the lack of, um, well, relative lack of exploration and mining in Egypt and Sudan is not from, not from the geological point of view, uh, the geological prospectivity is very good, um, but political and legislative issues um, play, play a major part. And I'll go, into, I'll go into some of the details of that a little later. Um, but a lot of these things, a lot of these are changing now. Uh, no, there we go. Um, this is a quite a nice summary map that's recently been put together by uh, Mike Porter in Australia, which is a, re a review of the ANS, and it shows the outcrop areas. Uh, one of the things that obviously happens with the developments in a um, oceanic island arc type terrain is you get dif distinct. Um, uh, terrain, uh, subterrains and sequences within within the overall a, um, ANS. Um, they represent slightly different um, arc sequences or microplates. There's distinctly different geology in them. Um, the Egyptian and the northern Saudi sequences are different to the ones immediately to the south in Sudan. Saudi has a distinct split between a western and an eastern set of terrains, um, cut by major faults. Um, if you go down into Ethiopia, we've got uh, terrains on the Ethiopian Eritrean area in here. We've got the western Ethiopian just stretches into Sudan, and then down in the south, Legadembe. Um, so it covers a lot. It covers a large area, but it's Quite, ge quite geologically distinct when you go into, diff into the different terrains. Um, as you'll see from the um, deposits marked on the map, um, there's a variety of um, minerals there. There's a lot of gold deposits. There's also a lot of copper, and then there's the, some, of the, some of the base metal deposits. So there's a variety of deposits that are um, known and a, a, a lot a lot more that are potentially waiting to be discovered. Um, one of the key things I think with the formation of a, an ANS, uh, um, a complete orogenic terrain like this is the earlier, the earlier deposits, the um, forms during the subduction and island arcs will tend to be things like porphyry coppers, VMS deposits, uh, you get potiform chrome as well. And then with the closure of the, the closure of the plates and the ocean and then 
um, comp continental compression, you get younger, but often overprinting um, orogenic deposits, orogenic gold deposits. Um, so you can you often see um, VMS deposits with orogenic deposits in close association, although age-wise they're very different. And in Egypt in particular, one of the things you see is ophiolite sequences which have orogenic gold deposits in them because those ophiolites have been deformed and, uh, and altered and then um, become a source for much later orogenic gold deposits. Structural settings are uh, very, very important. Uh, no structures can be old ones, uh, which represent old suture lines um, or, or the trace of island arcs. And much younger ones are related to the, um, the closure of the, the, uh, the whole sequence and the formation of Gondwana. Um, in terms of history, the um, mining history of the um, Arabian Nubian Shield goes back 5,000 odd years. Um, the table on the left is from a probably seminal piece of work by the Clems, um, husband and wife team, geologist and an archaeologist, who spent a long time studying the Egyptian and the Sudanese um, ancient mining sites. Um, and in fact, that reference book is, is one of the key ones um, that predates a lot of modern artisanal mining activity. So it's become a bit of a reference book for what the archaeology looked like before uh, it's been somewhat uh, modified by artisanal miners um, in both Egypt and Sudan. Um, what I, what's it, what's, um, what the, the uh, center through here shows are the phases of gold mining going back to, from about 3000 BC, Old Kingdom at about two and a half thousand, another period, 1500 BC to 1000 BC, and then uh, the Ptolemaic era at the end of the, um, the uh, pharaonic Egyptian uh, uh, time frame and the beginning of the Roman period, and then a much younger period, about a about thousand years ago, um, which often gets called the, the Arab era, um, when there was a lot of, when there was a resurgence of uh, gold mining in the ANS. The um, little coloured insert up at the, on the top right is uh, what they, what's regarded as the world's oldest geological map. It's called the Turin Papyrus. I'm sure many of you have probably seen pictures and uh, papers referencing this. It depicts a stretch of uh, Wadi Hammamat in, in Egypt. Um, and it was, uh, a guide for the pharaohs of the time as to where one of their um, stone quarries for the carvings that they would use in the in the pyramids and um, up, up at uh, Luxor and places like that and one of the gold mines was. The gold mine uh, we know where it is, it's a place called Fukaria in um, Egypt but what this serves to highlight is that um, there's a 5,000 year mining history um, and that mining history is that not, it's not just Egypt and Nubia, which is now Sudan. Um, it's also the Arabian Peninsula. Um, they had a very similar mining history over there. Um, and that mining was was not just for gold; it was also for copper. They'd, um, they there's um, places like Mahad al Dahab in Saudi Arabia uh, was a gold and a copper mine in in the old days. Um, in terms of the mineral deposits, as I said earlier, I'm going to focus on the metals, but um, yeah, other, other deposit types of, um, also occur. There's um, in the Red Sea Rift, there's, a, there's um, phosphates, there's uh, gypsum, there's a lot of marbles around. Um, so there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a huge variety of, um, there's rock salt as well. There's a huge variety of uh, deposits that are mined. Um, the ANS contains some significant um, mining projects. Um, I'm sure some of these uh, you're, you're familiar with. Uh, the, the, big, the big gold mine uh, that everybody's probably heard of is Sukari in Egypt. Um, Ariab and Bisha are the two big VMS deposits. Uh, one's in Sudan and one's in Eritrea. Coca is a, is a big gold deposit in Eritrea. And then the 
Saudi Arabian de deposits, Jabal Saeed's uh, VMS, Mahad Ad Dahab is, a, is an epithermal, and um, Ad Dawahi is one of the, the many orogenic gold deposits out there. Um, the types of deposits that I'm going to go through here are the, or the orogenic golds. I'll touch on um, that, that sort of links into some of the, the alluvial deposits. The VMSs, um, I've put, and SEDEX, um, because the formation of these VMSs could be closer to a SEDEX type deposit rather than a black smoker type VMS, but I'll, I'll, I'll sort of mention that a little later. <clears throat> then there's porphyries and epithermals, <clears throat> um, iron oxide, copper golds, the tin tantalums, and then I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll briefly mention uh, um, ophiolytic chrome and some uh, banded irons and, and uh, phosphates. And although phosphates are strictly speaking not part of the ANS. Um, in terms of gold deposits, um, this is a fairly um, well known um, generic summary of um, form formation types of gold deposits. It covers a lot of the um, gold deposits within the ANS quite well. So the uh, younger orogenics would be in uh, this typical. Um, setting uh, this sort of typical setting down here the porphyries the um, epithermals there are where there are um, what are almost certainly intrusion related golds within the ans which uh, would be sitting in this sort of environment moving on to the uh, vms deposits and the oceanic related deposits um, there's lots of ocean crust and island art material preserved out there uh, so and you get you get the full sequence from the VMSs at the top down into the chromite pods at the bottom. Um, the that's from the that's from Galley's publication on the um, VMSs, which is a fairly um, classic image. That's the sort of black smoker stack, um, and that certainly seems to be from what I from, from what I understand. I'm not visited um, Jabal Said, but that seems to be the sort of environment Jabal Said sits in. The Two images on the right I put in, and you, you probably spotted that those are SEDEX images, but they actually fit quite well with um, some of what you see in Egypt and uh, Sudan. Atlantis Deep um, is actually the type of VMS that's deposited in the bottom of the Red Sea, depositing at the moment. Um, it's, a, it's an area that's been looked at by the Saudis and the Sudanese in terms of of mining it. Uh, the sulfides are form as a clay um, beneath brine pools. So it's an environment that is perhaps closer to a SEDEX environment. It's certainly not the classic image of the black smoker stack that uh, you, you, would, um, you would commonly associate with, uh, say, Cypress type VMSs. Um, the there are, there are banded iron formations within um, the, a, the, the ANS, and these may well be a, a similar sort of thing to this SEDEX type environment. Um, moving on to the orogenic golds in particular, the map on the left comes from uh, one of several very good papers by Johnson on the, on the ANS. The yellow dots are where he's picked up a lot of the gold deposits, and uh, you can see there, they're fairly widespread. Uh, the map doesn't include the southern Ethiopian greenstone. Um, that's where Tulakapi is. Uh, so there's more, there's more gold deposits off the bottom of that map. Um, the one on the right is from the uh, um, South African Journal a couple of years ago, again by Johnson, but it was on the, it highlighted some of the gold deposits on the, on the Nubian shield. That's the that's Eritrea and Ethiopia. Uh, gold dots are the orogenic deposits. Um, the shaded zones are the transpective zones, which are probably sutures of some kind. Um, a lot of the deposits following, as you can see, following the structures and um, following the uh, well. When, when you if it was a stratigraphic map, you'd see it was following distinct belts of geology. Um, from the same paper, the Egypt and Sudan. Again, widespread of deposits. Um, 
the, the green stars, so I should have mentioned on the previous one, are, are the VMSs, um, and a, ver a slightly wider variety of gold deposits identified in, in Egypt in the paper. But as it, I think what these show is um, you know, widespread, of or widespread of orogenic deposits, and a lot of them are associated with the major fault structures and the suture zones, which are highlighted by you know, the red lines on the Egyptian map and the, the black lines on the uh, Sudanese map. Um, wall rock alteration not always present, um, and there's a variety of deposit types that you see. The pictures on the the pictures on this slide are small artisanal workings in Sudan exploiting quartz veins um, and these guys are these guys literally just take the quartz out or uh, more more commonly it's the uh, contacts between the quartz and the host rock very little um, alteration of the country rock in these cases very good targets for small-scale miners not not so good for uh, perhaps a, a, a larger mining company looking for a million ounces plus um, what you're looking for, what they would be looking for would be multiple vein systems or a, a package with a lot more wall rock alteration. Uh, some of these small, some of these small um, artisanal type operations have become quite significant in their own right. Um, and in, in the case of Sudan, um, have, um, they contributed quite a lot to, to the country's economy. Um, arti um, the, the artisanals and the historical ancient mining exploited both this sort of setting and um, overlying alluvials. The, the wadi gravels contain quite significant amounts of, um, of gold that are derived from these sorts of settings. Um, there's a couple of pictures uh, and the next slide has a couple more of uh, what some of these deposits look like. The uh, Bing image is of the carafe suture in, in Sudan. Uh, that's actually Manajam's uh, mining operation um, or pl process plant and camp down on the bottom there. The strip through the middle is the carafe suture. And if you've got a good resolution on your screen, all of these lines in here and then cutting across on various orientations through here are artisanal workings. So the suture zone has got a whole series, a whole lattice of um, quartz vein shear zone type workings which are being exploited by the artisanals. These would all be little little pits. Uh, what I quite like about this image is that in here these little uh, pale coloured patches are bulldozer scrapes in the in the overlying wadi or, or the wadi gravels that are shedding off the suture zone. So you've got the hard rock setting and and you've got um, alluvial set, uh, alluvials um, shown on the same image there. The right-hand image is another um, one of the more you know, well-known deposits in Egypt called Baramaya. It's it's in an ophiolite sequence. It's been um, affected by um, well thrust snaps and quite a lot of shearing. Um, it's in a sort of listronite package, but it's so uh, there's alteration there. But there's a, a quite a complex array of veins sitting within it. So this it's a it's a again quite a large one of these vein type systems. Um, these ones show a couple of the uh, more well-known deposits um, in the ANS ones in Sudan and the the other the other the other images in Egypt. Uh, Galat Safar is in um, Sudan. It's uh, Orca Gold, a Canadian company that have uh, discovered this. It's 3.3 million ounces at the moment. The uh, gold sits in this pale green horizon. It's a volcanic, volcanoclastic. The, the darker green is an andesite. The volcanoclastic unit has preferentially deformed and uh, been solidified, um, and it became the focus for the um, gold bearing fluids to flow through. Um, the, the block model has this orange block, which is a, is a volcanic intrusive of some kind, which has also been caught up there and been sheared. Um, so it's a, more, a much more complicated setting, there's alteration in it, uh, and it's generated a, a fairly large gold deposit. It's um, feasibility studies complete, they're, they're um, waiting for the politics to settle down a little bit and ra raise the capital and go into development on this one. 
Um, the image on the right uh, is uh, from Zohir, one of his one of his very good papers on uh, on the um, ANS and the gold deposit on the deposits of uh, well the mineral deposits of Egypt. Uh, it's a section that goes southwest northeast um, from Sakari, which would be sitting in there, up to El Sid and Fukawia, which are up in this area. It's highlighting the the setting of them. Um, the little image on the bottom, which comes from a paper by Helmi, um, shows it uh, quite succinctly. Um, you know, there's um, the Hafefit Dome is a core complex. The thrust it, it's tied up with parts of the um, several or sequences of thrust naps. On the side of it, the major fault zones. These these are known as the Nash faults, which come in from Saudi. Uh, the core complex is deform and alter the the um orientation of the uh fault structures or the the major fault structures um the in in the case of both sakari and el sid and Fukawia, which are in here there are granite bodies that are caught up in the intrus in the faulting these bodies are um harder they tend to crack rather than to rather than deform um in a ductile sense and they've become the focus for the gold mineralization in, in in both cases here the little cartoons are fairly good summaries um of what the deposits look like um so there's uh, the whole range of orogenic gold deposits out there from from narrow veins that can be operated by a, a small scale mining team up to multi-million ounce deposits which have uh, formed in settings where large tonnages uh, uh, can be developed. Onto the VMSs, um, too many areas in Sudan, um, Ari Ariab and um, Deradev. There's also some out in North Kordofan to the south um, on the South Sudan border, which is an area that's also regarded as being part of the ANS. Um, Ariab is world-class VMS district. Uh, in terms of size, it's the same, its footprint is the same size as the Iberian pyrite belt. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's huge. Um, in Egypt, a couple of areas, uh, Hamama and, and Daib. Eritrea, um, most of you are probably, are probably aware of Bisha. Uh, the whole B Bisha belt has numerous VMS deposits scattered along it, um, obviously now in production. Um, and then there's the Asmara belt, which is heading towards production. Uh, and that belt heads into um, northern Ethiopia and there's VMSs there. Harvest, I think, is the one that most of you might have heard of. Um, at Arab and Bisha, the attractive thing in terms of mining those is the oxide caps. Uh, they're a, a fairly unique weathering oxidation profile. Um, I don't think anybody's quite explained how they formed, but they represent significant gold deposits in their own right. Uh, the copper has been stripped out, but the, the gold numbers are impressive. Um, below that, you get large copper, copper, gold, zinc, um, all bodies in different, different combinations. Some are copper rich, some are, some are distinctly zinc rich. Uh, Ariab and Bisha, they've occur on major sort of major suture zones um so i my feeling and again it's but it's there's a lot of there's there's, like, there's debate as to how these things formed is that um Arab and bisha might have been retooled so the original vms mineralization has been reworked as part of the structural deformation and that might have actually had an impact on um concentrating the the sulfides and the met and the metals to actually upgrade the tenor of the mineralization as i mentioned earlier on the um on these slides with the deposit models um there's modern vms deposits forming in the brine pools and the red sea um and yeah they there's a there's a possibility that um the because we, because the deposits have been retooled and, and are structurally deformed, that the original um, types of deposit might be more of a SEDEX type, um, Atlantis deep type deposit rather than a black smoker. But I mean, I'm sure that's an academic debate that may well go on for, uh, for years. 
in the in the uh, the companies working out in Egypt and Sudan, there's lots of talk about hydro, um, hybrid VMS epithermals and hybrid VMS ZX type systems. So there's uh, quite a lot of debate about the the origin or uh, the origin and the type of mineralization that we see. But these things are the one thing that's important here is these things are um, ocean floor related VMS or ZX type systems, and they form some significant um, deposits. Um, back to the two the uh, the two maps we showed earlier, the green stars here are the uh, BMS deposits in uh, Eritrea, well, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Sudan. The Nakasub Such is one of the big uh, collision zones within the ANS, separating two very, very, very distinct terrains. Um, the Ariab cluster of VMS is uh, all sit within that suture zone. There's, there's some very, very heavily deformed sequences in there. The same is true for Bisha, which sits in here with its cluster, and also down the Asmara belt. Um, this is the weathering profiles. Um, Ariabs, um, a lot of people describe it as a, as a tulip. Uh, and then a, a slide from uh, Bisha at a presentation they gave a few years ago. The sequences are very similar on both deposits, starting with a, with a quartz iron um, sort of hematite type go uh, gossen up at the top down into a oxide material uh, down into a transitional zone in Sudan SBR is what they call silica barite rock um, the and it literally is that when you see it it's silica and barite that's all that's left um, becomes very powdery um, in Bisha, you get a, a, a pyrite sand on the, on the contact. Uh, Bisha's soap and acid units in here would be equivalent to the SBR at Ariab. The one thing you can hopefully see on both slides is the gold grades increasing from, say, less than half a gram on surface at Ariab down to 10 to 30 grams in the, at the base of the oxidation. You often get a bit of a supergene sitting right on the on the contact. The same happening in the, um, in the sequence at Bisha where the um, upper zones, the gold grades are uh, marked here at six grams. Down on the contact, they're getting up to 28. So there's a very, it's a very distinct, very, very unusual type of weathering profile, but these weathering profiles, when you find them, produce some significant gold mineralization. And bo both mines have, um, but yeah, proved to prove to be quite large gold producers. Um, in the case of Bisha, they're now moving into mine the primary sulfide. Ariab, it's now government owned. So they're looking for funding to actually start mining their sulfide material. Porphyry coppers. Um, this is a well, and epithermals. The, um, porphyry coppers have often uh, generally been regarded that um, the chances of finding them in the ANS, although, although because of the plate tectonic environment, there's no reason they shouldn't be there, but they would have been eroded out. Uh, and this is a project I know very well because I used to, I used to work for them. Uh, Jabal O'Hare is, is a porphyry, um, it's real, um, and it, it's 800 million years old and it looks just like a porphyry in South America. So, so they do exist. Um, it's, it's a couple of porphyry centers over a couple, uh, over a couple of kilometers. Um, it's got adjacent argillic and advanced argillic alteration, which may indicate um, additional porphyry centers at depth. Um, like Ariab, um, and Jabal O'Hare is about 200 kilometers north of Ariab, it's got a th thick weathering profile, but, it's, but it retains the copper in the, in the oxide zone. So, um, the yeah, you know, there's a there's a heat bleachable copper um, deposit potentially there. It's being evaluated at the moment. They've done a, I believe they've done a, a PEA uh, and they're slowly trying to advance it. Um, but porphyries, um, epithermals. There are a couple of well-known ones: Mahada Dahab and uh, Abu uh, Abu Kushaya in Jordan. Um, I should perhaps also mention Pandora in Djibouti, which is is younger, but it's also an epithermal. So there's definite potential for this type of mineralization out there uh, in the in the ANS, uh, and there's also there's also a couple of porphyries um, that I've seen made reference to in Saudi. 
Um, very, there's a quick summary, uh, schematic of um, the classic uh, porphyry system. The pictures on the right, the are of, of Jabal O'Hare. There's the stockwork veining. The black, oh sorry, the red in here is is where the um, stockworks outcropping. Um, so, yeah, it's it's real. The the how it's preserved, why why it's preserved um, at at an at a age of about eight hundred million years old. Um, I don't think anybody can quite explain, but it's there. Um, I'll move on through these ones a little bit. Um, a little bit quickly because I mean there's um, similar similar systems but um, they're perhaps not uh, there's perhaps nothing um, uh, that's really been developed into a, uh, into a mine as such. Intrusion related golds um, similar to porphyries but perhaps didn't uh, didn't vent to surface they tend to be they tend to be go, uh, copper poor but with um, associated with uh, Bismuth, sometimes tin, tungsten. Um, I've seen some people suggest that coca in Eritrea may be uh, uh, an IRG, uh, but I think that's open to debate because it could also be an orogenic. Um, the satellite image in the in the bottom is a deposit in in Sudan, which is a whole series of sheeted veins that's been picked up by the artisanals who are working on on this. That um, the grid squares are two hundred meters. Geochemically, that one fits the um, the the IRG or geochemical footprint. The host rocks are diorite, so there's certainly deposits out there that look like IRGs. Um, Aton resources up in Egypt have a couple of deposits they believe are IRGs. So the the, the potential's there. And in terms of a major mining company or a junior looking looking in a country looking within the ANS. Something like this with its multiple veins represents a reasonable tonnage and sort of resource um, sized uh, target. Uh, in this particular, in the particular case of the, um, the image at the bottom there, there's a lot of artisanals on there. So access isn't always easy. Um, iron oxide, copper, gold. Um, this, the picture, the two pictures on the right are ones I took a few years ago in Sudan. Fodakwan is a hematite body. Um, there are several up in the Fodakwan fire area of Sudan, which is up on the Egyptian border. The, the area also hosts narrow copper, iron, gold rich veins. Uh, there's an example of one there. Um, yeah, it's running 1% copper, there's two and a half grams gold in there, and it's got 34 grams iron. Now that, that is, that's never going that's not going to be economic in its own right, although the artisanals actually work some of these. Um, but the, uh, the correlation of having some of these fairly big hematite bodies and veining systems like this suggests that there may be, we, we may be looking at a, a, a IOCG type province the plate tectonic setting would suggest that you're probably uh, looking at a setting that's similar to some of the Chilean examples. So you're in sort of uh, very, very deep levels of a porphyry copper type system. Um, tin tantalum. Uh, there's been a there's there's been quite a quite a lot of work on the particular example I've shown in the picture there, but there's a, a lot of Tin tantalum, rare earth, granites around the ANS. Um, the, the cluster sitting in the dark red on the map here are perhaps the best known examples. They're in, they're in Egypt. And Abu Dhabab, which sits in there, sorry, that one, is perhaps the most well known example. It was drilled by uh, Gibson from Australia um, about seven years ago. They put a fairly decent resource together on it. Um, the, there's, there's also some associated tin gravels. This particular deposit was going into production and then there was a uh, disagreement between Gippsland and the government and I, they, I believe this is actually going through a court case at the moment. Um, but I put them in just to sort of show that there's, uh, it's, not just, it's not just gold and copper, there are some fairly significant um, tin tungsten resources uh, and, and the associated minerals that go with them within the ANS. Um, 
just briefly a few of the others, um, polyform chromites, um, <coughs> an area called the Inkasana Hills in Sudan, close to the Ethiopian border, hosts some of the largest. Um, and like, like most of these sorts of deposits, they're, um, they've got, they're, they're often associated with nickel, uh, cobalt, and PGs. Um, there are band, uh, banded ions. Um, Wadi Karim up in Egypt is one of the one of the more well known examples. Uh, and the, these are within the sed sedimentary units within the ANS, and then you know, they they're probably sedex type things. I should also mention, although they're not strictly within the ANS, that there's a uh, um, the Mesozoics in Egypt um, contain some quite significant tonnages of sedimentary iron ore, which have been looked at by various people. Um, the grades tend to be low quality. Um, some areas, some areas is okay. Some, uh, quite a lot of areas is poor, and the thicknesses can be quite thin, but they they cover quite significant areas. Um, and the final one, which again strictly not in the ANS, are the phosphates. Um, these are these are two big developing projects. One in one in uh, Eritrea up at Kalulia, and one at uh, Danakil in Ethiopia. Um, they're going to be they're going to become fairly significant mining operations in the next um, the next few uh, few years. Um, Kaluli was uh, worked on by an Australian company that's now London listed. They they they're raising money to go into development, and um, da, Danakil was um, was Alana Resources who um, who resold or sold out to an Israeli. Uh, concern a few years ago. Uh, both both projects are going into production, and they're going to be fairly significant to the uh, economy of both countries. Um, let's briefly mention um, artisanal mining, and these are all Sudanese examples. Um, there's a million artisanal miners in Sudan. Uh, some of them working from the sense basically basically metal detectors picking up nuggets. Some of them have developed into quite substantial and um, open cast mining operations. Um, the it, it it has its it it has all the um, social um, issues associated with artisanal mining. There's a lot of mercury involved, um, but for Sudan, uh, also Eritrea and Ethiopia, um, there's quite significant numbers of people involved, um, and they you know it's it's a bit it's become a big industry. Um, a brief sort of country backgrounds on, on the four African countries uh, that we're looking at here. Um, the map shows the, the Middle East. Um, and I think if you look at that, you'll see some countries there that probably raise some alarm bells if you read everything, if you read ev or believe everything that you read in the press. Um, we've got Yemen and Somalia in there. I Iran has a rep reputation. We've got Iraq in there. So it's an interesting part of the world. Um, it's also on the Red Sea. You've got um, direct access or relatively direct access to uh, markets in India. You've got ac direct access to the, the Middle East and places like Dubai. You've also on the doorstep of Europe. So it's actually from a point of view of producing a, uh, something like phosphates or copper, it's quite an, quite an interesting part of the world to be working in. Um, Sudan, um, that's just a... Uh, the uh, well, the uh, political map and uh, geological map. The purples are Precambrian terrains. The the greens are the Mesozoics. The uh, Nubian Shields up in the top here. There's a little piece down there, and then in the North Kordofan and South Kordofan. The debates where there's a debate as to where the ANS stops and the um, Sahara Megakraton starts. Darfur's out in here, uh, and this is an area called Hofrat and Nahas, which is a historical copper mining area. Um, politically, the country's um, had, had its ups and downs, um, I suppose to put it politely, over the last few years. 2011, South Sudan gained independence. I mean, that, they, they, so the South inherited most of the oil reserves. Um, Going a little bit back in history, Sudan's um, been, been designated a state sponsor of terrorism um, because of what the, re the regime at the time was doing in Darfur. There were uh, arms embargoes, there's international criminal court involved. Um, 
the, sa the sanctions basically made it very difficult to work in the country. And the Americans lifted the sanctions in 97, um, but the arms embargo and the um, ICC uh, um, uh, cases are still ongoing. Um, more recently, the former regime of al-Bashir has been, been removed. There's a, new, there's a new regime in place, um, transitional government. Um, they're, try, they're trying to actually bring Sudan back into, back into the fold. Um, so the arms, um, yes, yeah, the, so the, the Americans lifted the, um, their uh, sanctions a couple of, couple of years ago, but the arms embargo and the ICC warrants remain in place, which still makes it quite difficult to do business there. Despite that, there are some fairly big companies that have done business there for many years. Uh, there's a few of them listed there. Um, the, the minerals industry is governed by the, the Ministry of Energy and Mining uh, through an organization called SMRC. Um, the concession system is fairly, is actually fairly standard. They, they'll issue fixed term uh, prospecting licenses and mining leases. Um, they are, uh, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ground rent and royalty system with the state receiving a free carry in mining operations. Uh, some of the terms in, uh, at the end of the old regime were getting quite onerous. Um, they were, the government was looking for 40%, 30 or 40% free carries, which doesn't really work for most companies. The new regime is looking, is looking to how it can reform the uh, licensing system and encourage, encourage companies to come and, come and look for mineral deposits. Sudan's gold production um, in 2018 was just shy of 80 ton, which is the third, making it the third largest gold producer in Africa. 89% um, of that comes from artisanals. Um, and until recently, it was the gold production purchased by the government. That's now recently changed. Companies can now freely sell gold overseas. Um, that's, there's some of the sort of key operations um, in Sudan. Um, Ariab is the, the big existing mine. It used to be owned by, or used to be operated by La Mancha in joint venture with the government. Um, they mined about 2.2 million ounces or produced about 2.2 million ounces of gold from the oxide caps. There's another 800,000 ounces sitting in the leach pads that can be, see, uh, can be retreated through a CIL. And there's a significant gold copper resource in the, in the sulfides. That's all the gold that I mentioned earlier. I mean, that's, that's three and a half million ounces. To the south of, just to the south of Orca is Menagem, the Moroccans, with a, another three million ounce resource, and then Jabal O'Hare, which is the, the uh, Qatari-funded porphyry copper operation. The, that's a concession map from last year. The yellow, all of these yellow blocks up here are all associated with the ANS, scattered blocks across the rest of the country. Access to some of the areas in Darfur and on the South Sudanese border is a little bit tricky. There's still, there's still tensions and uh, conflict issues going on down in this part of the world. The north up here, access isn't a problem. Um, quickly on to Egypt. Um, the ANS is the reds and the purples. You see here in uh, southern Sinai and then all the way down through the eastern desert. Um, uh, Aswan's in here, Kara is up there. Uh, the rest of the country is predominantly Mesozoic and younger sediments. There's a bit of Precambrian on the border here with uh, Libya and Sudan, and then a, little, a few small outcrops of granite popping up through the, the Mesozoics. <coughs> um, Egypt's also had experienced sort of its political upheavals over the last 10 years. Uh, Mubarak was removed. Uh, Mohamed Morsi took over. He was then removed. Current government, um, headed by LCC, under the, um, who's a former military chief. Um, country's economy is based, based largely on tourism, agriculture, and natural gas exports. Um, the, very, similarly to Sudan, there's a, the Ministry of Petroleum and Minerals um, uh, is, is in place, and the mining sector is administrated by EMRA. The mining legislation in Egypt was followed uh, the approach taken by the oil industry. So 
production, agree uh, production agreements were structured as 50-50 joint ventures with the state. There were bidding rounds um, and production sharing agreements. Um, as a result, very, very few companies have been exploring. Um, the only company that made a success of it was uh, Sentiment at Sakari, and that's part and part of the reason for that is because it's such a big um, deposit that it could actually hand uh, could actually handle the economics of the uh, conditions at the time. Um, the industry stagnated. There's a, few, there's a few guys I'll mention in a minute who've been who've been certainly trying to keep the industry running, but it's very difficult under the under those conditions. January this year, the government legislated a change to the mining legislation. So the uh, process has now moved on to uh, a more standard one, exploration leases and mining leases, um, with the government deriving its interest from application fees, ground rental and royalty payments, although the, uh, the bid round process remains in place. Uh, the bid round, there is a bid round on at the moment, it was announced in February, that's what's shown on the, the map of the left. Um, they're offering blocks that cover uh, eight, eight, one eighth of a degree um, portions of the eastern desert. Uh, bid round was due to ex expire in a couple of weeks, but that's been extended to now mi uh, mid-September. Uh, media reports suggest there's a lot of interest, and geologically I can understand that. However, some of the costs they put in um, related to the, um, the actual application process and the ground rents, if you're successful, are, are high. And it'll be interesting to see how many people actually do, do put bids in. Um, key operations, I mean, sent, sent them in. Um, it's a huge, uh, huge deposit. Um, where, uh, I'm sure most of us are familiar with it. We've we've all heard about it. Aton is the other Canadian that's been working up in the north. They're actually this little block up here. Um, they've got a, a small resource on a VMS called Hamama, but a, a whole series of deposits on their license. There's some quite look, exciting looking ones. The other company that's um, uh, I'll I'll mention briefly now because they've just put out a press release saying they've found discovered a million ounce deposit is uh, Shalatin, which is an Egyptian military operation. They hold these green licenses in the south here. Uh, they don't say where the discovery is, but it's probably on one of these licenses down here. Um, Ethiopia and Eritrea. I mean, I've I've grouped them together here, part, uh, partly for convenience and partly because their um, their histories are interlinked to some extent. Um, the ANS is these these reds and browns up here, and the, the western greenstone belt there, and then the Tula Kapi southern greenstone belt down there. You can obviously see the uh, the the rift running through the middle, and then this is the Afar hotspot. Um, history wise. Um, Quite a, quite, a, quite a torrid history that Ethiopia's had. Uh, there's, there was a military di communist dictatorship. There was a, the famine of the mid eighties, um, Eritrea splitting and becoming independence in 93. Um, there was a very bitter border war between the two, uh, 90, you know, 98 through to 2000. Um, Ethiopia refused to accept the, the, the terms of the the border, the border treaty as part of the peace treaty. So there was a standoff for many years. And it's only the new president in Ethiopia who's uh, actually got the Nobel Peace Prize for accepting the, uh, the peace treaty terms as, that to normalize the relationships between the two countries. Um, Eritrea has also had problems with um, UN sanctions. Um, they were targeted uh, from 2009 through 2018 uh, for supposedly supplying arms to Al Shabaab in Somalia, um, Eritrea's human rights record does get attention. Um, so, the, the, the Eritrea in particular has had some had some had some issues, and not not dissimilar to Sudan, but it has gone on to become a very successful mining destination. Um, the industry is governed by the again the ministry of, um, ministry of energy and mines with the national mining corporation holding the state's interests um one thing that's 
that's quite good here um, is the Mining Act is based on some of the examples from Australia, so it, it is a good Mining Act. And the Eritrean government ha does follow its its um, participation interests. Um, they certainly paid for their, their stake, their full stake in Bisha. So it's a government that's taken a proactive view to, to being involved in the mining industry. Um, partly because of that, it's, be it's, become, it's become probably the most successful over the last 20 years in terms of getting projects developed. Um, Bisha is obviously the big one. That was uh, Nevsun, it's now Chinese. Um, the Zara project and the Smara project, which are um, two of the other big projects, are now also Chinese owned. And then the other big one is the uh, Kaluli phosphate project. So there's four quite big mining projects that are either in production or heading into production. Ethiopia, again, a um, similar system with a, the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum legislation relating back to the mid 80s or you know, mid 90s. Um, not much exploration happening um, before the before the sort of early 2000s. Um, currently, the, the Ethiopian government is looking to re revitalize its mining legislation to encourage investment in the mining sector. Um, and I was looking this morning, they have a, an online mining cadastra system, which um, is the only, the only one amongst the four countries that I've, I've mentioned so far. How accurate it is, I'm, I'm, I can't say. There are people who work out there who probably have a better idea. Um, but yes, they do have an online mining cadastra system, which is, a, which is certainly a, a step forward. The key operations, um, the, 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 there are two that I think people, well, two, two that people probably um, are aware of in Ethiopia. One is Legadembi which was mined by uh, Mid, uh, Midrock, uh, Ethiopian organization. They, they, they mined the mine out until 2009. It's now, it's now closed from what I understand. Kefi Minerals is the, um, is the most advanced project that's heading in towards production. They're out in here at a place called Tulukapi. Um, and then the other big projects, um, the Israelis up in the Danakil on the, on the border up in there. Um, other, the other, the other large, well, probably most well-known company working out there is East African Minerals. Um, they're working up in the north, up on the Harvest Project. There's also Alta Strategies from uh, the UK who are up here, and there's a cluster of other companies, um, so certainly working out in the Western Greenstone Belt. Um, I see I'm just about on time, so I don't forget questions. But there, there's, there's, there's my concluding comments. Um, so there's a long mining history, excellent um, geological setting and an expanding range of deposits. One thing, I sh one thing I would stress is the quality of the local workforce. I mean, really good quality graduates, uh, a lot of highly skilled staff. A lot of the, dia there's, there's some really skilled people in the diaspora who work overseas as well. Politically, Sudan and Eritrea have, have perception problems, but that's, that's, um, that's certainly changing. There's a new government in Sudan. Um, which does bring hope for the future. E Egyptians and Ethiopians are actively trying to promote mining investment, um, and you know, a long-term vision needs to be needs to be adopted to really um, be inclusive for all stakeholders. Uh, so, including a lot of the small-scale miners. And um, I, I'll leave it there. I'm not sure if there's much time for questions, but uh, uh, thanks for listening. Great, thank you for a very fascinating talk. Um, and yes, we have plenty of time for questions. So you can either raise your hand or just jump right in and ask Chris some questions. Anyone? Um, we have one right, comment from, okay. please carry on. Okay, so I just want to find out, this is Clive, uh, in terms of uh, investment into the area, uh, where is the most money coming from? Is it coming from the London Stock Exchange or London investors? Because I don't see a lot of like uh, companies from Australia and all that. It depends on the, on the, on, on the, on the, 
country. There is there is Canadian money. I mean, Orca are Canadian. La Mancha were also Canadian listed. There, the Australians were around as well. Recent years, there's been a tendency for the Chinese to become quite heavily involved. They've taken out big operations in Eritrea. Um, there's quite a lot of Middle Eastern money as well. Um, they the um, the operation I worked on up at Jabal O'Hare was Qatari funded. The the Emiratis and the the Saudis have been looking. Um, the Russians have also been exploring. So there's quite a lot of money coming from relatively non-traditional sources. Um, they, Turkish companies um, are active, uh, yeah, as as are people like the Moroccans. So so yes, there is some there's some money from the Canadian, the London, and the Australian markets, but uh, but a lot of it's coming from other sources. Any more questions or comments? Well, Chris, it seems that you got off lightly today. Thank you so much for that talk. It was yeah. truly fascinating. Um, I'd just like to thank our sponsor for the month, who is TerraCore Geospectral Imaging. Uh, they're sponsoring all the talks for July, so thank you very much for them. And thanks very much, everybody, for logging in. Um, I'm going to end the meeting now and have a lovely afternoon.